you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. When the Iron Lady sings it, it's way better than I had to do for the first 15 years of the show. I hope you enjoy the Iron Lady from the Bugs Bunny comic. That's why I imagine when we, uh, we we put that bit together. And uh, after 14 years of my audience hearing me sing it, I think they'd had enough. At least I'd had enough. So welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. The Chris Voss Show family is a family that loves you, but doesn't judge you. At least not as harsh as your mother-in-law. She never liked you anyway, and she wanted her daughter to marry Bob. So try and do better. <laughs> but if you want to win her over, refer to the fa- the show. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Subscribe to the big LinkedIn newsletter that grows like a weed and the 130,000 group over on LinkedIn. Chris Voss, one on the TikTok at eChrisVossFacebook.com. As always, we're bringing the smartest people, the billionaires, the CEOs, Pulitzer Prize winners. We have governors on the show. Now we have a state representative. We had, I think we have multiple state representatives on the show. You name it. We have smart people on the show that bring their ideas forward and share with you their stories of life so that you can learn and educate yourself better because that's what our audience does today we have anita burrows on the show with us today she's going to be talking to us about her experience and some of the things she's done in life and how she's trying to change and impact the world she is what is referred to or she refers to herself as the good troublemaker i'm the bad troublemaker by the way but she's the good troublemaker she's the third term state representative from New Hampshire who entered politics with no experience in 2016. She beat the sitting speaker of the house who had been in office for 37 years. That's quite a feat if you understand politics and, and uh, you know, how, how uh, people stay in office tend to stay in office. She's known for her willingness to challenge the status quo and for her dry wit. Welcome to the show, Anita. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for coming. It's wonderful to have you as well. But dot coms, where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? Well, I have my own podcast. It's digging in, digging in nh.com. That's probably a good place to start. There you go. So give us a 30,000 overview of yourself and what you're doing there in New Hampshire. Sure. I've been in New Hampshire probably a little over 30 years. My husband dragged me here from the Boston area, (laughs) kicking and screaming, but I love it here now. And after the 2016 election, after, I mean, I'll be frank, after Donald Trump won, I was pretty upset. I, I don't drink. I rarely drink. But the next day I said to my husband, please take me to the nearest bar. And I got the biggest margarita I could possibly find. And after I was hung over the next day, I said, well, I can either do something constructive or I can drink for four years. So I decided to go the constructive route. Mm-hmm. And I, I decided I decided to run for office, which shocked even myself, decided to run for state representative. And this is the great thing about our democracy, is that almost anyone can run. I think there's some age limits to certain things, but almost anyone can run. People can be participants. You know, we've talked about this before on the show. The greatest thing about our democracy is that we're all the stewards of its care. And we shall think about that and sit down and read the Constitution. And the and I always advise people to read the Federalist Papers as well, because you can really see the arc of the shaping of the Constitution, the thought thinking that went through behind it tell us how did you how did you you ended up beating the speaker of the house this is quite the journey tell us you know how you went through this process of of winning office and and it was actually a fairly simple strategy which Mm -hmm. is which the speaker did not do which is that i canvassed I went to I went to house after house after house. I, I, I live in a small community. I don't even know exact number of people, but I canvassed every possible house I could. And when I did that, when I knocked on doors, people said, you're the first person I've ever had knock on my door in the time that I've lived here. And that's how I won. There you go. And and that's the beauty of our democracy. Once again, you know, going, you know, getting out there and the, the grassroots pe- being the people who want to who want to who want to take in you know they, they want to be listened to they want to be representative or represented if I can learn to speak and so that's really great and and a, there, we saw a lot of that activism 
of from from the Donald Trump era, and I imagine throughout our democracy, where people get sick of the status quo, they get sick of you know some of the log jamming in in Congress and stuff. And so, uh, t- tell us, you know, what you did was it, it is kind of tantamount to you know what we talk about a lot on the show with entrepreneurism. I'm sure there was a lot of people just like an entrepreneur who said, "Oh, you can't do that. You can't overthrow a speaker who's been you know writing incumbent in office for 37 years." Did you get a lot of naysayers? And how did I you did mentally- I did want to. I did. When I started out, people said, you know, they'd call me into their house and they said, you're not, what, how it makes you think you could possibly win? But you know what? I think I was cocky enough to think I could actually win it up. So I, I, I think you have to go into that, into a campaign with the attitude of I'm going to win, even even if it's it's a far-fetched thing. And, and I was determined to win. Um, I knew that my opponent, again, I'm not going to say anything negative about him. He's been a public servant for all those years. He's still a selectman. He didn't. He didn't get out and talk to people. So that's that's why I won. There you go. Beauty of getting in and listening. And there was a lot of different. I think people that were entered Congress because they went out and they worked the doors or the phones or you know all the things of of getting out there. Tell us how you grew up. What gave you this moxie? Maybe was there any influences growing up to politics, or was politics completely new to you? It was um, completely new to me. Mm-hmm. My family wasn't super political at mm-hmm. all. Uh, you know, my father maybe you know he had. He had gumption. He he started a, a jewelry manufacturing business when he he went to trade school and he built a very successful build a business. So I imagine I got some of that from him. But I mean, this was just completely completely not in my wheelhouse. I had been a board chair for a number of organizations okay. in my community, so people did know me. But mm-hmm. I mean, it was crazy, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I went I went to this. I walked into the state house the first day. And when I walked in, people were there to greet me and they said, oh, you're the dragon slayer, oh. <laughs> which, which is a little yeah. nickname that I've had. And uh, I, I walked in, I thought, what am I getting myself into? But <laughs> but I find that I have a passion for it and I really, I really enjoy it. I mean, there are days you want to shoot yourself in the head and there are other days that you feel like you've really accomplished something important. There you go. And you're, you're in your third term now? I am in my third term. Uh, I... I will be running again, and I decided I will stay in office until I start falling asleep during sessions because I will. I'm turning seventy this year. Oh, really? Well, yeah. there you go. Yep. What What are some of the things that you find rewarding? Because we want to entice people to do what you're doing. I think everyone. Yeah. I think we should get more normal people. I'm going to box you in as a normal person if you don't mind. I, I hope so. I hope people but, uh, think of me that way. <laughs> you know, we, we need a few less billionaires and, yeah. and trillionaire, trill, trill, multi million. You know, we need some normal people. And my understanding of reading the Federalist Papers is it was intentionally supposed to be our smartest and brightest people, not our richest people running for office or just anybody be well, going to yeah. be off in office. That's kind of that's the beauty of the New Hampshire legislature. We're, we are the largest legislature, state legislature in the country with 400 people. Wow. And so it's a great place to to come, to try to, you know, you have a better shot at getting elected here than in other states. And plus we have a really big salary of $100 a year, which is taxed and we, and we have to pay for our own badges. Wow. Yeah. It, your guys' salary is $100 a year. So you're doing this kind of funds that you raise for the community to, to be elected. That's a, that's a, maybe we should do that with the federal government where oh, that's you know. a thought, that's a thought, <laughs> but you know, so you have 400 people who are there cause they want to be there. Yeah. And we have, we increasingly have young people who have other jobs, you know, yeah. a guy who sits in back of me, he's now in law school, but he financed, he was able to go cause he worked for Olive Garden, you oh, know, really? as a waiter. So it's, it's become, you know, it, it's really nice to see more people who don't have gray hair in the legislature and, and people of yeah. all, all walks of life and, and colors of the rainbow. Yeah. And, and, and I think, yeah, we need to see more of that, especially at the, I think it was Warren Buffett who joked, if you were, if you want to see minimum wage or things actually get done in, in Congress, maybe you should, you know, put them on minimum wage too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. They might, they Absolutely. might give a crap a little bit. They're yeah. like, what? But evidently, a lot of them are suffering. They're actually having to live in their offices, evidently, but between their trips to the Cayman Islands or something. I don't know. There's there's a lot of money in politics, yeah. which is interesting. Tell us about some of the things you've accomplished, maybe overcome while you've been in office, and, and maybe some of the challenges that you found okay. you know, stepping into this sort of hornet's nest. That- yeah, I, I would say actually the most challenging term was my second term. Mm-hmm. And it was challenging because we had... 
a number of extremists who were swept into office in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, they were. We have a group called the Free Staters who uh, came to decided to take over our government from. Believe it or not, they chose New Hampshire, which is between New Hampshire and Alaska. New Hampshire won, and mm -hmm. they decided to have. Uh, they wanted 20,000 people to move here and take over the state government. And they've actually done a pretty fine job of doing that. So my second year, uh, my second term rather, was very challenging in my committee. I'm on Commerce Committee because these people basically blocked anything that we tried to do. They blocked bipartisanship. And mm -hmm. it was a really miserable two years. In fact, it was so miserable that seven out of the 10 Dems on the committee said decided not to run again. Wow. I stuck with it. A number of those people who were disruptive got booted out. And mm -hmm. we went from being the worst committee in the state house to, in my opinion, the best committee because oh. we're very bipartisan committee. We like each other. We disagree on a lot of things. We, you know, we sit next to each other. We talk. So it's been such a, a, a such a great change. I, I'm really, really happy to be there now. There you go. When we had, I forget the name of the, they used to anchor on MSNBC for a lot of years, for decades, Hardball, whoever did Hardball. It's oh, Friday, Chris Matthews? It's Chris Matthews. We yeah. had Chris Matthews on the yeah. on the show. We talked about his time with Tip O'Neill, where he worked under Tip O'Neill. And, you know, they would, you know, they would work together. Tip O'Neill and Reagan, you know, they didn't always seem like they were going to get along, but they worked together and stuff. And it seems like a lot of that got lost after i can't remember who came after tip o'neill but you know we, we started this we started this sort of pathway where you know we can't meet in the middle we can't agree you know we can't we can't find a way to 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 build bridges to each other and and i think that's what dissuades a lot of the american people you know we want our legislators to work together and find resources and stuff now but it just seems to be just complete gridlock you know i mean you you saw that with 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 Obama, where I forget the Speaker of the House at the time, but he's like, and 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 Mitch McConnell, or like, yep. we're just not going to pass anything he does. And you're just like, seriously, like, not even for the good of the, like, like if he if he said we're gonna, I don't know, we're gonna make sure babies survive birth and live longer, you're gonna shoot that down, like, what the fuck. <laughs> You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you can use the F word on this show. But anyway, yeah. I mean, I my feeling is I will work with any any person on the other side of the aisle mm -hmm. if we have an issue that we can work on. There, right now, I'm one of the sponsors of a cannabis bill. We've tried to get this passed in New Hampshire for God knows how many years, and I'm working with a woman who is known pretty far to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been great working with her. I mean, mm -hmm. we're very committed to that. She's really good at what she does. I'm learning about her, learning a lot from her. So that's what you have to do. You have to latch onto issues that you can find commonality and work together and agree to disagree on the other stuff. But we're very hopeful that we can get this passed. And I think because it is because it's a bipartisan effort. There you go. Do you think that you think that the the way to resolve a lot of this deadlocking that we have in Congress is to bring more? I, I want to use the term again, normal people, average people, people, uh, the common people. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, like an elitist I, when I yeah, say that. No, I think <laughs> it's, I think, I think the average person, that's a good idea, but it's also, frankly, I think we need moderate people who yeah. are not from either side of the aisle, mm -hmm. that they're not extremists. And mm -hmm. uh, we're working really hard to try to coax moderates to, to run, in fact, part of a nonpartisan group. And we're looking for candidates from both sides of the aisle to run for some of these offices. And mm -hmm. I frankly, I mean, you know, my party might not be happy with me saying that uh, I I am happy for anybody to win some of these seats to take them away from the extremists. I don't care mm -hmm. which party they're from, if they can knock them out. You know, I, I think my audience knows this, but I, I've gone from being a Republican in the nineties and nine 11 kind of woke me up to like, why does everyone the world hate us? And, and, and I wasn't really happy with George Bush. I, I do mm -hmm. junior, or I'm sorry, the presidency of Dick Cheney jokes there. And, and then I moved to becoming a Democrat and a liberal and now I'm a moderate Democrat. And and I think I, I like where I'm at right now because I can see both sides. I can sit down and look at the arguments on both sides and I can say, okay, I, I see what this person is, is trying to do. I'm very against the extremists of both parties. I, I'm, I'm very hard on, on the extreme left in, as a Democrat, but I'm also very hard on the extreme right. And I think, like you say, the, the, these are the people that are making things awful, that are trying to drive everyone apart 
they 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 can't meet in the middle. But I, I've gotten good at being able to sit down and look at both sides and 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 say, okay, well, I see what they're trying to accomplish, and I see what we're trying to accomplish, and maybe we're just not going about it the right way, right. and maybe we can find a way to mix and match. And there has to be compromise. You know, no one can oh. in any community. Let me tell you about a small thing that happened to make the bipartisanship happen. And it's such mm -hmm. a simple thing that the term I told you about that was awful. We were seated on separate sides of the room. It was like the Roman Coliseum, yeah. you know, who was going to, who was going to kill the other, other person. <laughs> and in fact, I can say this now, my mother-in-law can rest in peace. But I said to the group, they, you know, they were roll their eyes at us and, you know, <laughs> make hand gestures. And I'm not saying that, that nobody on our side ever did it. And I finally, one day I said, you know, if I wanted to be treated this way, I'd go visit my mother-in-law. Oh, and they were taken aback that I said it, but I think I think it kind of brought the whole the point home. But I guess where I'm getting to is this year the chair decided to intersperse us, and oh, I ended up I sitting like next to somebody that, frankly, the, the term before I couldn't stand. And I love this guy now. I mean, we've talked, we got to know each other. He's got a great sense of humor, and we find commonality. And that you know, it's it's talking to each other and sitting next to each other yeah. that makes a huge difference and getting probably to know each other like yeah you know, they everyone's got a family everyone's you know got a husband or wife or kids they mm -hmm. care about the future of their children they're that's probably usually a lot of their motivational interest is creating a better future for where we're going and uh, yeah i think you're right we need to bring more moderate people what would you say or encourage people that you know are like you know i hear a lot of people say that they're like oh i, I never want to go do that it's just so toxic and and what would you what would you say to encourage people to to get more involved in care? One thing I, I I like to invite people to come down to Concord, where our there legislature is, sit in on a committee and see what it's like, mm -hmm. and see some of the some of the bills that we pass that make a difference in people's lives. And I think you know the rule, the rule of thumb: never ask somebody to run for office for first meeting. Ask them on the fifth time that you talk to them. So you just kind of gonna kind of bring them in unsuspectingly, then you ask them. But I think coming down to Concord, people say, I mean, I remember I, I was brought down from a, somebody who was a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. And I had this th idea in my head that the people in Concord were just not very bright. Mm -hmm. And I was stunned. I went to a couple of hearings. I was like, these people are really smart and mm -hmm. they know what they're doing and they're really dedicated. So that really encouraged me to, to, to follow this path. Yeah. Everybody has to make compromises and, and settle. I mean, it's just, it's any community in a relationship you have to make, you, you, you can't just, you know, go, it's my way or the highway, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a personal relationship, if you try and do that in your marriage, have fun with that. You I know? did. It didn't work, but we're, we're doing well now. It's been 30 <laughs> there <you> years. <laughs> there you go. Somebody, yeah. somebody figured out the compromise. Yeah, yeah. It was good. The, uh, and you know, we have to do those human beings in our society, our communities and, and work together. And, and sometimes things work out really great and even though maybe one side opposes it you know one of the things that's really helped me in a lot of conversations that i have with people now if they want to have politic discussions with me is i say okay we're, we'll have a discussion about topics and ideas but we're going to lay a foundation here you and i aren't republicans and democrats we're americans okay the, the constitution is the foundation of what we are we are both americans Fuck the Democrats, fuck the mm -hmm. Republicans and their and our little argument we're gonna have. This isn't about teams. We are on team America. And laying that foundation seems to make a difference in the conversations I have because I can always bring it back to wait a second. We're both Americans. We're here to do what's good for each other. And it seems like when we set that foundation on on that's really what we're about. And we used to kind of have that, you know. It used to be us against the Russians. It used to be us against the Chinese. You know, now we've got Tucker Carlson over there interviewing him right. and playing footsies with him. Same thing with Victor Arborn. And and if you understand what the what the arc of the intent is there, you understand the evil intent of it is is disruptive to the American ideal. And that's what we need to remember. We're you know, we're not in these opposing teams. What are some other things you're you're proud of accomplishing in, in Congress or, or not in Congress, but your your local place there well, that's uh, I think one of the things that, that I feel good about my work is, again, through mm -hmm. my podcast and I have a blog, I'm trying to let people know what's really going on in the state house, which is that we do have this, ex these extremists, the free staters slash mm -hmm. libertarians who are trying to undermine, um, they're, they're trying to minimize government. And the, the, one of the key ways that they're trying to do that in New Hampshire is through education. 
And we have these things called the freedom, freedom account vouchers. And what these are is that the, they, if your kid goes to private school, whether it's a religious school or if you're homeschools, you can get up to 5,500 per kid. Wow. And that's draining money out of our public school system. Mm -hmm. And for some of the parents who are homeschooling, there's no accountability and, and other states that have that have that there have been there have been people who have taken their kids to Disney with the money or wow. used it or used or there was an article about some state where they bought jet skis. So this is, you know, they are draining our public school system and it's, it's really frightening. Meanwhile, you know, public school systems are, you know, like have different testing. I don't know if the George Bush thing's still in play, which I think was a failure. No child left behind policy. Wasn't that a complete failure? I think if I recall rightly, it just overly tested, I think. But but you know, I mean they're they're required to some sort of testing requirements. Most schools are, but somehow these voucher systems get around them. Yeah, I mean, again, with the you know, and and some of the money, some of the people who are getting them were already in private school. So why are we giving them assistance for something they were already mm. able to do? I mm. mean, and I'll just tell you a, a quick story in my county. Some of these folks who were in county government were able to sell a an, a historic courthouse that was probably worth about two hundred fifty thousand. They sold it to one dollar to a charter school with religious ties. Wow, one dollar. Um, no. So they're really good at what they do, and we're really tr doing our best to let people know in the state what's going on. There you go. And there's the, you have to understand, or people need to understand, the darkness that, that goes behind this because it's it's extremist, right wing, religious based, and what it's up to. Betsy DeVos is Center for National Policy. Right is one of the evil hands behind this. And of course she's, she's made her billions off of private schooling, but it, it's even darker in the intent of what they want. They want a Calvinistic sort of religious, they want Bibles on every corner and they want, they want the constitution thrown out for and replacement of the Bible. We've had several authors that have documented the center for national policy and the, was it two, 250 little evil underlings of that organization that uh, it umbrellas and and what their intent is to do and their intent is to overthrow the u.s government and turn it right. into a, a theocracy and not right. a democracy and and yeah. with these these people they call them government schools they're trying to in some in some way put them out of business and the yeah. charter school i just told you about is affiliated with betsy devos yeah. and hillsdale college <laughs> which is a right wing you know i guess you're familiar with you're laughing really? is a right is a right wing Christian school, and those are the ones who are moving into this charter school. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize is their intent is an American ISIS. They want ultra. They want a religious theocracy. Democracy will be thrown out. Everyone will be forced to read the Bible, just like ISIS forced everyone to read the Quran. Or the is it the Quran? Yeah, it's Friday, and for some reason my brain has stopped working. And there's lots of books you can read to validate this. If you think I'm full of shit, there's lots of documentation. If you understand the whole Betsy DeVos thing and and part of it is money and power and power but part of it is is the intent of of their religious beliefs which they're entitled to think you know that's what our constitution does but there is a distinct separation of the church and state um, well well not that. so much in new yeah. hampshire but and the <laughs> the other thing that they're doing is really scary is that they're they're doing their best to undermine the lgbtq plus community we mm -hmm. have we've had a lot of anti-trans legislation and we're really fighting hard against against that because it, it's it's just it's just horrible it's yeah. just horrible and plus they use it as a cudgel to get out the vote on stuff. What a lot of people don't realize, and you can go back through this through numerous authors we've on the on the on the show, with the Betsy DeVos organization, her father, where this all started with Nixon and the this the the great Southern God, what was it called? The Great Southern Strategy. And and they tested everything they could to get out the vote, to get people to come out and vote for Republicans. They tested everything. The only thing that worked was abortion. And so they have been pounding abortion up until the time they overturned Roe versus Wade recently. And they've been, and part of the strategy has been stacking the court so they can get what they want with either religious principles or the abortion issue. Well, the reason that no legislator no has ever, you know, presented legislation to curtail abortion is because they knew it was the only way to get out the vote. And so now they're kind of stuck because the dog caught the car 
And now the dog doesn't know what to do with the car once it caught it, and they're stuck. So the only way they can really get out the vote now is to pull the like the LGBTQ stuff, and your yeah. kids are being taught to be gay in schools when really they want American ISIS of theology, theocracy, and in the Constitution thrown out, and the rules of the land will be the Bible. So if you think ISIS was not really cool and all those other folks over there, it's just American ISIS when you really understand the, the evil intent behind it and the agenda. No, absolutely. You know, we're we're living living the dream here in New Hampshire. And we actually just in the house anyway, we we got a bill yeah. to fail that even Texas said was too was too extreme, if you can imagine that they were trying to get that passed. Yeah, and they're the ones yeah. who are always trying to leave. The yeah. Cover. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was a good that was a good win. But in our because we're so close in numbers, four hundred people, our majority is decided every day, depending on who they can who comes in. And they'll even call people up and say, We're gonna send a cab for you you know, get your butt in here. I mean, both sides are doing it and just, you know, we need your vote. So we're all, you know, really, most of us are very careful about getting, making sure we're there to vote. What a lot of people need to realize is when you hear this thing where we need to minimize state and federal government, this is the liberalism that comes, that, that was largely espoused under the Reagan administration and what Reagan wanted to do, destroy the U.S. government, make it so that you know, basically we'd be at the whim of capitalism and and whatever Elon Musk wants to do this week and screw unions and, and all the stuff that they did that was very illiberal that took away rights to people. In fact, encouraging jobs to ship to China and to, to destroy the unions. And if people will go read books and understand what a li liberalism is, this is the same sort of thing. And the reason that billionaires and multimillionaires are funding this sort of movement to minimize state and federal government because they don't want regulations. You can see it when Elon Musk talks about, you know, these, these people want to be able to pollute like it's 1970. They want to be able to not have any worker restrictions. They don't want to have federal oversight of any kind whatsoever. And what you have to understand is most of them are globalists, like Elon Musk, most of the billionaires and multimillionaires that back the federal society and all these different things. They want to be able to do what they want, regulation free. And so their move to minimize state and federal government and, and the nuances that they make and the talking points, there really is an evil intent behind it because they don't want you to have rights. They want a docile environment like they get in Vietnam or like they get in China or like they get in Philippines or any other country around the world where they, they can have a wink and nod, shake your hand, pay right. you in the back pocket sort of experience. They want America to be as pliable as they can do in their globalist society and other countries. You have to realize that they really don't have your best interests at heart no, as normal no, no. Americans. You know, you know, it's interesting, Chris, there's a, right now, I mean, I told you about the cannabis issue mm -hmm. and learning through the process, how much big business and big box is involved in trying to shape the cannabis industry, what mm -hmm. it's going to be in New Hampshire so that they can get a hold of it. And, and the yeah. big, the big, the big fish want to, keep the little fish out and they want to create a monopoly. So it's been really interesting to follow that and doing what we can to prevent that from happening. But it's hard when you're dealing with people with that kind of power. And I don't know if you've, if you're having the same thing like San Francisco and other states had, California had, where it was actually the prison and police unions that keep jobs from putting people in jail for cannabis fought the hardest and spent the most money to fight legalizing cannabis. Wow. You guys have wow. there? No, haven't seen that. Huh. But I'm really confused as to why our governor has been so reluctant to sign cannabis, Governor Sununu into, mm -hmm. into law, but we're really trying to pass it now because if he's willing to sign something, it's a crapshoot. You know, we can either wait till we get a perfect system without these big business people, or we can try to pass something now. Yeah. And we feel this is the window. Let's go for it. Cause it's, you know, who knows who's going to come into office after he leaves yeah and it's 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 always about big money and big money influence you know the prescription drug makers don't want it i remember when vegas or it was nevada actually legalized cannabis i i drink in vodka pretty heavily for about 20 years and i can tell you that the things you will do on vodka or alcohol are far worse than you could ever do on <laughs> cannabis. And I, I never really got into pot until it was legalized. And uh, wow, what a difference it made. And I went from someone who was consuming bottles of Tylenol 
wow. for pain in my old age and probably for a few hangovers. But, you know, consuming lots of Tylenol, which isn't good for you, by the way, folks. I'll get sued, but what the hell. <laughs> but uh, it's documented for a while. But I went from that to cannabis. And I, I had for year, decades, had all my friends go, you should try it. It's really great for pain. And, you know, people with PTSD and other health-related issues, cancer and stuff, they started giving them cannabis. And, like, it really helps. And I'm like, no, you're just really high. Because I can tell you vodka helps, but I'm just really drunk. And I'm like, sure, okay, whatever, whatever you tell yourself for that little drug there. But no, man, that that stuff is. I I, I remember going into my medicine cabinet one time in the bathroom, and I'm like, holy crap, there's this Tylenol that I that's been sitting here for like six months now, and I haven't had to take it because it, the pot is so relaxing. Yeah. And yeah. so I can see why you know maybe some of the lobbyists from Tylenol and Big Drug are like, yeah, we can't have that cutting interaction. You know, I tried, you know, my husband is always, a, as long as you're a legislator, later, a legislator, do not buy cannabis while you're, while you're there. Cause everybody in New, in New Hampshire is going over to Massachusetts or Maine to buy it. But so when we were in California, I said, can I please buy some here? It's legal. So he's like, yeah, go for it. I had a gummy and I, same thing. I mean, I used to get up seven times a night. It was the first time in 20 years I slept through the night. Baby. I mean, it was incredible. And I, you know, I'm, I'm <clears throat> as a as a substitute, I'm using hemp right now, which works pretty well for me. It's legal, and I mean, it it helps a lot of people with so many medical mm-hmm. problems. It really oh, yeah. does. It really does. Like yeah. even my mom's tried it, and she sleeps so much better. It 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 does. It, it it makes such a difference. But you can see how it's natural. And while there's a lot of uh, small entrepreneurs that got in on it in like places like Vegas and California, they opened it up. But you know, there's there's always the people who are like like you said, big money trying to control it, and manipulate it. And it we live in this interesting dichotomy of a of a, of America where we have this fascination where we love rich people and we worship them. And we worship the almighty dollar. Maybe this is the side benefit on bridal capitalism. But it's it's I, I've heard that there's been research that said that one of the reasons that we really don't want to legislate so much millionaires and billionaires is because we all think we're gonna be a millionaire or billionaire someday and we're like, well, maybe we shouldn't have regulations because I'll get there someday. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something though, in commerce, you know, I came in, I think as a Democrat being more interested in regulation than the Republicans, I've come over to realize, at least in terms of small businesses, we do a lot to get in their way. I increasingly feel the way the Republicans do in that sense. Let's get out of their way. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, you know, we have all these rules and regulations for liquor licenses. Let's get out of their way. Let's get, let's this, this little restaurant get a liquor license so that they mm-hmm. can thrive and hire people and do well. You know, I, I, I do believe in oh, that less regulation is sometimes a good thing, again, particularly for small businesses. Particularly for small businesses. Yeah. We need yeah, to get yeah. back to being Main Street have power. You know, I've watched Main Street be diluted since the 80s. And, you know, you can see the detriment in the middle class that has faded away since since Ronald Reagan era. You know, that trickle down, trickle down economics check I'm still waiting for. And, you know, it's just made more people desperate, more people broke. I think I think you can look at society and say one of the reasons we're off the rails and flirting with fascism and authoritarianism is because people are so damn desperate and pushed to the wall financially. And that's usually how authoritarianism and fascism happens. That's how democracy dies, is people get so broke and rode down that they're willing to take anything, as long as the trains will run on time, until they don't. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely yeah. agree with you yeah. on that. So we're at a dangerous point. I, I, I like what's going on in state legislatures. State legislatures seem to be at least more grounded what's going on at a federal level. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, at the federal level, we have these performative sort of people that they're not really interested in legislating. If you look at what they actually put forward for bills and legislation, they don't do anything. They just, there, there seems to be these people that do performative stunts on social media. And, you know, when the cameras are rolling, they're acting up and, and, and they do it to bring in donor money. They, they, especially with these small funders, I didn't realize it until recently I heard someone say it, I think it was a Bill Maher show. They said the reason they act that way is because of the new advent of, of small donor money and so they're literally getting by doing these performance stunts they can get all the crazy people that are small donors that are kind of on the extremes will flood them with money and they've learned that they can just keep hammering away at that you know and i didn't it didn't really ever occur to me and i'm like holy crap that makes sense 
because big yeah I, I i hadn't big. thought i hadn't thought about that at all but right. i think that is it makes sense we have that to a lesser extreme because national media doesn't often come into our legislature unless something big is going yeah. on and the other thing is you know we can actually any person legislature late legislator can put forth a bill that could get passed mm -hmm. that can get passed and it's 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 a pretty cool thing yeah. And so I, I, I guess what I was setting up was, I think you'd agree with me that this, this the sanity seems to be a little bit more at the state level and people shouldn't be dissuaded from getting involved in government based upon some of the craziness at the federal level. Uh, don't, don't assume it's it's all sane because we had two <laughs> bills on kangaroos, one to allow them as pet kangaroos and the other to allow us to serve them as meat. <laughs> and we also, we had a 15, uh, somebody put forth a 15 day abortion ban. You don't even know if you're pregnant at 15 weeks, uh, it's 15 days. So it basically is banning sex. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, there are some people probably that support that, that should be banned for sex. So they don't breed, but that's, <laughs> that's a joke I always use. I think that's true. That's a good idea. I've been known to tell people directly in their face, you sh really shouldn't breed. But I think you're going to take care of that on your own, the way you behave. You but, should be in the legislature. You're, you're perfect for it. Yeah. I don't know. I probably resolve to violence and get arrested. And okay. I, I, I would probably break down eventually. So I'll, I'll leave it to people like you, a better moxie and, and better backbone. Cause I, I don't know. I, 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 I love people that do things for the public good, like police officers and firemen and, and educators and stuff. My mom, mom and sister were teachers, but I, I'd have trouble with it. I'm one of those people that I, I'd end up being a bad cop because it would just taint me eventually. And I just go rogue. And then, you know, the office, my, my sergeant would call me in and be like, you know, this is the third pedophile who hasn't made it back to the, uh, somehow ended up in the drink and with a bullet <laughs> oh, in his head. God. And I'm, I just misfired. He's like, it's the third one this week, Chris. And I'm like, well, I did catch I, him. I think it's good that you're not in law enforcement. Yeah. I agree See, with I, you. I know yeah, where I'm, I, do. Okay. I know I'm not. I'll stick to podcasting. I can't get into much trouble. You're good at that. You're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I leave it to people like you. And I, okay. and, and I think your story encourages or hopefully encourages other people to get involved. And we need more people involved. I think... Correct me if I'm wrong or feel free to give your spiel on this, but I think one of the reasons that there's so much toxicity thrown up and the performative crap is to dissuade normal, sane people from getting involved in politics and tuning out. And that way, a very small electric electorate, a very small group of special interests can control elections. And we see that now. I mean, I really would love to, for us to have a law like, I think, Iceland or Greenland and other countries where you have to show up and vote. It's a law. They'll throw you in jail if you don't vote. And I think everyone should be forced to be involved and, and vote, especially as lazy as Americans are, me being one of them. So, I mean, it, it, don't get dissuaded from the ugliness of politics. Get involved because the reason it's probably ugly is because not, not enough people are caring, I guess. Yeah. And as I said, in a state like New Hampshire, you can really make positive changes um, mm -hmm. if you're willing to do the work. Yeah. And that's the beauty of our democracy. You know, the, the power of the states versus the power of the federal government and, and the balance that it gives to each other. You know, a lot of people don't understand, you know, one of the things that saved our most recent election was the fact that the Madison and, and a lot of the other people who designed this realized that there could be a chance to seize power if, if voting was controlled by the federal government. And so they gave the power to the states. So the states had the ability to control it. And a lot of people don't realize that made a difference in 2020 in trying to seize an election. The, so the importance of the states being there are, are, I don't know, you could probably say almost more important than the federal government. There's a balance there, which is kind of interesting. Well, we can mitigate some of the damage that's being done in Washington. <laughs> that's how I look at it. There you go. Yeah. And, and states tend to be the leaders on things with, you know, the, yeah, in yeah, things, absolutely. pot, absolutely. gay marriage, yeah. and, and a lot of the things. They, they tend to be the ones that seem to be more of a reflection of what the populace is thinking. And, and then uh, once they move in enough mass, it seems like SCOTUS decides to agree when it's not stacked. <laughs> well, I, th I think a biggest challenge for us right now, I, I'm sure across the country, is getting young people out to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of, I, I remember, I forget what year it is, people said, I'm going to, I'm only coming out to vote to legalize weed. And it was like, really? 
That's <laughs> all you care about? I mean, yeah, it's nice to have, but there's a lot more going on. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, the, and, and I think people need to realize the intent is there are a lot of people that don't want you involved, that don't want you knowing what's going on, that don't want you to care. They want you to give up and go home so that they can run your democracy. And we, it's very dangerous when a very small group of people that aren't the, the most popular, you know, we've seen this in, in the recent years, going back to Al Gore, where the will of certain voters that can stack the specialists of 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 the electoral college can game it and override the popular vote of the will of the people you know here in here in utah where i'm visiting right now i think about five years ago they legalized marijuana by popular vote of the people mm -hmm. and the legislation republican legislature is no screw that we we're going to override the will of the people and do what we want to do and there's still i think there's barely a medical marijuana thing that's been available it, it would never was intended like it you know it, it was in like las vegas where i don't think it was fully recreational you would still have to go through a doctor like california used to be for a long time but uh you know it's it's really important that people get involved because if you don't care um you know evil people can win and the the intent of the electrical college and the gaming of it is also what we talked about earlier with the Betsy DeVos and the mm -hmm. Center Center for National Policy. That was their ideal. They they realized a long time ago in the 70s with Nixon that why bother winning all the states? You just have to game the electoral college. Why bother, you know, trying to win popular ideas when you can have the federal society stack and pick judges that will hopefully if you can, you know, you can game enough electoral college wins and override the popular vote that you can eventually get a stack of religious right wing SCOTUS things. And then you can buy them with RVs and whatever you want through citizens United rulings. And you can, you can do whatever you want. People don't realize the billionaire intent of that is just to make a government with a docile people that can be manipulated and run any way they can and basically enslaved really when it comes down to it. So that's the evil intent of it is to make rich people richer and poor people poor. And if you haven't been paying attention to you, to what's going on, you can call me a liar all you want, but the stats are there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Any final thoughts as we go out? You said you have a blog too. I know we gave a plug to the podcast. Uh, yeah. If you, if you go on, you can subscribe on, on my, on my website, digging in nh.com. You mm -hmm. should be able to get on. And I occasionally uh, put my blog on Substack. I'm going to do it more regularly. There you go. Yeah. It, it, one of the things I've really enjoyed, I don't know if you've thought about this or tried this yet, but there's one guy who's really sane in the in the federal uh, Congress, and he's on TikTok, and I think a couple other social media, and he has a, and I, and I think he's might be Republican or maybe he's Democrat. I don't know. That's kind of that's kind of the interesting way of he delivers it, but he delivers a straight talk, very calm, very factual. You know, he's not ranting and trying to, to raise up the thing. And he does it on TikTok and he does a really good job of That's it. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd love to I'd love to see that. I huh. and my just on my on my podcast, I tend to be pretty level headed during when I'm interviewing something, but I also have a segment called the New Hampshire Putts of the Week, political putts of the week, and that's when I rant. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's where I uh, rant. <laughs> I think it's Representative Jeff Jackson. I think um, I've heard that name. I, I think that's I have heard that name. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's Representative Jeff Jackson. Yeah, write that down. And he he gets on there and he talks to you in a way that you want your Congress people to talk yeah. to. Yeah. And, and he talks very calm and he goes, let me explain to you. And he, he tries to cut everything down to the simplest of terms of what's going on. And he tries to be as honest, I think, as he comes across as honest. And it's just so refreshing to watch his stuff. I mean, I think there's some other people that are starting to do that in, in the federal Congress. And, and, and TikTok is such a great place to reach out to those young voters like you talked about. But just having a, seeing someone have that same conversation. <laughs> I actually, I actually even saw Senator Markey on TikTok, who's from Massachusetts. You mm -hmm. know, who's he's old, even older than me, which is old, and he did a great job on that. You know, it's yeah. a great, it's a great venue. In fact, we had the governor of Massachusetts on, who's one of the most. Who I, I'm not sure if he's still in office. One of the most popular governors in the nation, Republican Governor Charlie Baker. No, he's not in office anymore. There's yeah, a, a, he's a, a, there's a woman who's governor yeah. now. Yeah, but one of his things was being trying to be bipartisan, trying to get along, and 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 I think he was he was voted one of the most popular 
governors at the time. Yep. And, 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 you know, just, we need more people that are saying the, in the thing, we need more people that care because they want you to give up folks. They want you to turn a blind eye so that people can just control and do what they want. And we're all stewards of this democracy. You guys have heard me say this before. We are all stewards. It's each of our responsibility. Right. You're given the power to vote for a reason because it's your democracy too. And once people convince you that it's not your democracy, you're not going to like how it turns out. It never ends well. So you know what, Chris, a really good way for people to start out if they think they want to get involved is run for local office, run for selectmen, get, get even get on your library board um, mm -hmm. where they're doing crazy things, trying to ban books, you know, selectmen, planning board, go do that. It's a mm -hmm. great way to start out and then you can move on if you're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Read the Constitution too, I would say. Mm -hmm. Read the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers are extraordinary to read because you see the real intent. I mean, you can, you can read the Constitution and it's a great document when you realize the simplicity of it and, and stuff. But when you when you go through the Federalist Papers, you really see the intent of, of, of all the designers and, you know, like you'll hear all sorts of idiot arguments. Like somebody was arguing, I think, with me on social media the other day. And they're like, we need to get rid of the federal government just for the state. And everything. I'm like, have you ever read the Federalist Papers and the explanations to why they, they designed it that way? Why they, you know, because they, they consider both arguments at the time. So there you go. The more you know people, the more you read, the more you educate yourself. That's important. So that's why we have guests like you, you on the show, Anita, and and everyone else. So we can try and get everybody up to level and caring. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on, Chris. It's it, I really do. There you go. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anita, for coming on. Give us your dot coms one more time so we get those plugs. Uh, and digging in nh dot com is where my my podcast is, and you'll be able to get it most of the places you get your podcasts. There you go. And, okay. and try to move to the middle, everyone. Try and figure out how we can all get along, as if we can quote the the famous guy. Says, "Why can't we all get along?" There you go. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. Go to Goodreads dot com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn dot com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss one of the TikTokity, and all those great places on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.